Father in heaven, how we thank you for your grace, how we thank you for your goodness. Oh, my Father, as we open the word of God for this particular lecture tonight, I pray that you would move by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll need our graphics people to be sure that we're on the right graphics and they're switching. Okay, there we go. Our topic tonight looks at one of the most significant chapters in the book of Revelation. We call this topic a moment of destiny. The book of Revelation leads us to eternal decisions for Christ and his kingdom. We are facing a crossroads in America a crossroads in the world, and we're at a moment of destiny. I believe that Western society is at a crossroads right now in our world. In fact, one writer wrote this, Christian morality is being ushered out of the American social structure and off the cultural main stage, leaving a vacuum in its place, and the broader culture is attempting to fill the void. In other words, there's a lack of morality, a lack of spirituality, and the culture around us, the secular godless culture, is squeezing godliness and Christianity out of this society. You know, there's been a lot of research that's been done recently, and it reveals a growing concern about the moral condition of our nation. And many American adults admit that they're uncertain about how to determine right from wrong. For the first time in American history, there is a confusion of values. What is right? What indeed is wrong? In fact, the Barner Research Group said this, 80% of Americans, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic status, or political ideology, express concern about the nation's moral condition. Are you concerned about the direction that America is going? Are you concerned? Are you concerned about the waning moral values? Are you concerned about the confusion of true godliness of what's happening indeed in our society? In 1980, approximately 72% of the United States population said they trusted the government almost always to make the right decisions. That's 1980, 72%. What do you think the percentage is today? Any guess? Well, somebody said zero. Not quite that bad. <laughs> today, only 19% of the population say they trust the government to, to make almost or always to do the right thing. Would you agree with me that in the United States of America that has been a bastion of Christianity and Western Europe and Western society that moral values indeed are waning? We are a society in trouble when popularity is more important than purity, a nation is in trouble. When money is more important than morality, a nation is in trouble. When you look at the situation in our society and when entertainment is more important than godliness, a nation is in trouble. When pleasure is more important than purity, a nation is in trouble. When there's a confusion of sexual roles and sexual orientation and God's original plan of one man and one woman for a lifetime, is flagrantly violated, a nation is in trouble. When crime is rampant in our schools, and Christ, rather when crime is rampant in our streets, and Christ is mocked in our schools, a nation is what? A nation is in trouble. Now the ancient prophets speak to this generation in trumpet tones. Solomon Proverbs 16, verse 24 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You see, righteousness exalts a nation. Nations in our society are great because nations are good. 
But when a nation ceases to be good, it ceases to be great. And when you cut down the tree of Christian morality, the fruit of Christian virtue dies. And so there is a decay that's taking place in the Western world, in our society. We live in a crumbling society. And the book of Revelation clearly outlines what will eventually happen as moral values crumble in America and around the world, as the pendulum swings way, way left, it will ultimately swing back way, way right, where church and state will unite in an attempt to reestate Christian values. And when church and state unite, historically, every time church and state united in America, or any place around the world, you can go back to Puritan America, but when it united in Europe, when it united during the Middle Ages, persecution came to those that did not go along. Now, the Proverbs 26 verse 2 says, as the bird wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. The curse causeless shall not come. There's the law of sowing and reaping. We reap what we sow. If we sow immorality, we're going to reap lawlessness. When you look at what happened in the Roman Empire, you can see incredible parallels with Rome's collapse in what's happening in American and Western world society today. It was Edward Gibbon that wrote the book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He spent 20 years studying the Roman Empire, and he looked at the major conditions for the fall of the Roman Empire. When you look at those conditions, they are very present in our society today. The first thing he said is there was a decline of morality. The family unit fell apart, immorality became commonplace, the rapid increase of divorce, the undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home, the basis of human society. When the family falls apart, when immorality is prevalent, prevalent you know, I should qualify this. In ancient Roman society, there was not very much divorce. But what happened was, in ancient Rome, when a man and woman were married, the woman had to agree that the man could have extramarital affairs outside of marriage. And so the whole family unit had a real uh, structure that fell apart. Do you know in ancient Rome, uh, in the first century, the population was about one million. One third to uh, 40 percent of that population were slaves. So you had the very rich, you had the very poor, you had the slavery, the, the, which is dehumanizing. It, it, it's a terrible blot on humanity when we see that. Secondly, Rome had financial problems. They had higher and higher taxes, but the taxes were not on the rich, they were on the poor. And the national debt uh, soared, uh, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, then they had to spend more public monies for welfare, and so Rome's economy began to fall apart. Then they had this mad craze for pleasure. Sports became extreme. One Roman writer said this. He said, if the Roman favorite lost the chariot race, all of Rome would be sad for weeks. So they were sports mad, sports crazy. crazy. But the sports became more brutal every single day, every single month, because you had the gladiator, and people would come and watch the gladiators fight, and then as one man was lying on the ground all bloody, and the other gladiator took up the sword to put it through his heart or slit his throat, if the crowd put their thumbs up, it meant, yes, stab him, and they put their thumbs down, it meant, don't stab him. I mean, brutality. Internet, movies, the average 12-year-old in America today has seen 14,000 murders on television. You see, it, it was a violent age they, they, uh, in, in ancient Rome. They built gigantic armaments when the real enemy was within. Uh, Gibbon says that in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, the, the uh, decadence of the people uh, overwhelmed the military and money was lavishly spent to build their army. And so they had people that were starving, but they were lavishly building armies. Then there was the decay of religion. The pagan gods never uh, could satisfy 
And so faith faded into a mere form. Uh, they lost touch with life. They became uh, uh, important. The, 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 the church that was so important to, to warn and guide the people, uh, that, that voice was silent until the New Testament church came along. The book of Revelation predicts that at a time of moral collapse, a time that we are seeing before our very eyes in Western society, that a time at that time of moral collapse, God will have a message, a message that leads men and women to repentance, a message that leads them to confession, a message that leads them to understand and grasp the reality of the power of the living Christ. The Bible predicts that at that time of waning morality, just before the union of church and state, just before an economic boycott, Revelation predicts that a message would go out for the coming of Jesus to prepare men and women for his soon return. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him, I'm quoting Revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his servant unto, this, uh, unto John. Look, God had a message for humanity. According to Revelation 1.1, he gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to the angel. And the angel gives it to John. And John writes it down in a book. As you and I pick up the book of Revelation, as we study together the book of Revelation, it is a book that comes from the heart of God. It's a book that comes through Jesus. It's a book that comes through the angel. It's a book written for you and me in this generation to prepare us for the coming of Christ. That's why the Bible says, blessed is he that reads. Blessed are they that hear. Blessed are they that keep the things that are therein, Revelation 1, verse 3. So as you come every night, there's a special blessing for you. God's going to touch your life. God's going to bless you in a special way. Blessed are they that read. That's why when we read off the screen, God blesses. Blessed are they that hear. When we listen to the prophecies of Revelation, we are blessed. Blessed are they that keep. The reason for these prophecies is not so simply that we can hear them, not simply that we read them, but that they transform our lives. And did you notice what it said there? It said, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to show unto him things which must shortly come to pass. So the book of Revelation reveals what's going to take place. And the theme of Revelation, you see, some people think, you know, Revelation is a closed book, but the Bible calls Revelation, it is a revelation. It's an unveiling. And Revelation is to prepare people for that great event of the second coming of Christ. Now, the high point of Revelation, that the, the message to prepare people, is found in Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to be studying Revelation 14, the next three or four sessions. So you don't want to miss one session. Because what did the Bible say about those who hear, those that read, those that keep? They are what, everybody? What are they? They're what? How many want to be blessed? Can I see your hand? Amen. We want to be blessed, don't we? So Revelation 14 is God's message to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. Revelation 14 is divided into three parts. The first five verses take us from earth to heaven. And there we see a group of people that follow the Lamb Jesus wherever he goes. We see the redeemed. Now, often John in Revelation will start with the end and bring you to the beginning. It's a Hebraic way of thinking. So you start with these people in heaven. Then you have verses 6 to 12 is the message that prepares them for heaven. Then verses 13 to 20, 21 are the event for which they are prepared. Tonight we're going to start at the end of Revelation 14. And then tomorrow night, we'll begin unfolding the message. But we want to look at the event at a time when society is falling apart, at a time of crisis, political crisis, economic crisis, at a time of natural disasters, at a time of waning morality. Jesus is preparing a people for his second coming. You know, James Russell Lowell said this, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil time. 
or for the good or evil side. This indeed is where we are in history. Right now, God is sending out a message, an eternal message in the book of Revelation to lead men and women to make decisions for Christ and his eternal kingdom. Those decisions necessitate stepping out from the crowd. Those decisions necessitate a personal commitment. It's a decision that your husband cannot make for you, your wife cannot make it for you, your son or daughter, your friend cannot make it for you. Jesus speaks to each one of us individually and leads us through the conviction of his spirit to make eternal decisions to be prepared for his coming. He drives us to our knees to ask, Lord, what is your truth? What is the revelation of your will for my life? He drives us to our knees to confess our sins. He drives us to our knees to open our hearts to receive his power. There will come a day when every human being on planet Earth will have made their final, irrevocable decision. I've seen people do that so many times. One night I was preaching in Coritiba, Brazil. And that night I passed out a card like this, but it was a very straightforward card that said, I want to accept Christ as my savior. That particular card wasn't our prayer request card, but it said, I've drifted from Christ, I want to come back. And on one place on the card it said, I want to follow Jesus all the way in Bible baptism. Incidentally, if that happened to be your decision tonight, just put a B on the back of your card because I want to pray for you specially. So if you've drifted away, you want to be rebaptized, or you want to be baptized, just put a B on the back of your card and I'll pray for you. Well, anyway, I was in uh, Coritiba, Brazil, passed out the cards. A young man in that audience looked at the card. He said, this is my time. I've got to make my decision for Jesus. I know, I know that my life has not been in harmony with, with God's will. And he checked the card, I want to follow Jesus. Check the card, I want, to, I want to give my life to Jesus. Check the card, I want to follow Jesus in baptism. He didn't turn the card in, unfortunately, put it in his pocket. What I didn't know about that young man was that he had been a drug dealer. What I also didn't know about him is he owed a lot of money to other drug dealers. That night as he went home, he was a married man in his 20s, had a wife, two kids, went home that night And uh, as he was entering the door to go into his apartment, a drug dealer who he owed money to shot him and killed him on the doorstep. His wife found him in a pool of blood dead there. When they had his funeral, his mother had gone to his home and she found in his pocket the card that he made a decision for that night. And his mother came to the funeral with the card There were scores of young people at that funeral. And she said, my son, my precious son, made a decision for Christ in Pastor Mark's meeting. Although I have lost him, I haven't lost him. Because when Jesus comes again, I will see my son. And if you're hesitating, be sure to make your eternal decision for Christ. That young man came to that meeting that night And the Spirit of God touched his life and he was changed. Revelation's last day message leads us to eternal choices. The last part of Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 verse 14. Let's read it together. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, four things about the passage we want to look at. First, the white cloud. Secondly, the Son of Man. Thirdly, the golden crown. And fourthly, the sharp sickle. Now, notice it says, John says, I look. God gave John a prophetic vision. He looked up into heaven at the end of Revelation 14, and he sees the white cloud. He sees the Son of Man. He sees the golden crown. He sees the sharp sickle. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 9, and 10, just as Jesus was here once, he was going to ascend to heaven. And notice the similarity of Acts 1, 8 and Revelation 14. While they watched, that's the disciples are looking up into heaven. He, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Men of Galilee, the angel says, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? 
this same Jesus, this same Jesus that was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Man steps off a mountain and goes down. God steps off a mountain and goes up because the law of gravity cannot hold the creator of gravity down. And the disciples are straining their necks to see the last glimmering glory of Christ as he ascends. And the angel says, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, the Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Galilee, the Jesus that touched blind, blind eyes and they were opened, the Jesus that touched withered arms and they were healed, the Jesus that touched legs that were crippled and couldn't walk and they jumped and walked again, the Jesus that forgave sin, the Jesus that drove demoniacs out of human, drove devils out of the demoniacs, this same Jesus is coming back. He ascended in the clouds. He is coming back in the clouds. So when you see this idea of the clouds, in Revelation 14, verse 14, the same Jesus that ascended in the clouds, literally. The same Jesus that ascended in the clouds, visibly. The same Jesus that ascended in the clouds, gloriously. This Christ will come again. Now notice, and I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man. Now this Son of Man expression in the Bible is a very unique expression. It's used 82 times in the Gospels, 82 times. Why do you think when the Bible talks about Jesus coming as the Son of Man, it doesn't say Son of God? Why, does, why, do, you don't, why do you think it, does, it emphasizes his humanity rather than his divinity? Here's why. Because Scripture wants us to know that the Christ that's coming back for us is our friend. He is the Son of Man. He's your brother. He's coming to take you home. You have wandered in this world too long. You have wandered in a world of sickness, of suffering, of heartache and death. And the Son of Man, the one that came once, the one that faced every temptation in common with humanity, the one that was tired, the one that was weary, the one that understands what it's like to be rejected, for every woman whose husband has left her for somebody else in a divorce, Jesus was rejected too. For everyone that's felt betrayed by a friend, Jesus was betrayed too by Judas. For everyone that's ever been hungry, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. He understands that. For everyone that's ever had a craving, whether it's alcohol or tobacco, you say, Jesus didn't use alcohol or tobacco. No, he didn't. But in the wilderness, the cravings for food were greater than any craving that you'll ever experience for alcohol and tobacco. You see, here's the Son of Man. For everyone that's ever wept at the loss of a loved one, Jesus wept at the loss of Lazarus. And he resurrected him to let you and me know that he can resurrect our dead loved ones too. What this expression, son of man, is a precious expression to us. We, close, we hold it near our hearts because it is the son of man. It's our friend that's coming back. It's our elder brother that's coming back. He need, we need not fear that. Now look at these expressions. Look, Matthew 16, verse 27. You ready to read it with me? For the what? For the what? For the who? Son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels. He'll reward each one according to his works. The son of man, Jesus, king of kings and lord of lords is going to come to take us home. Matthew 24, verse 27 and 30. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the son of man. Then the son of man will appear in heaven. You take every Son of Man reference and you can apply it many, many times to the second coming of Christ. So, when Revelation 14 talks about the Son of Man coming, it's talking about Jesus coming to reap the final harvest of our world. Matthew 24, verse 30, Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, I want you to notice this quite carefully, this passage. Does this seem like it's going to be anything secret to you? For as lightning comes from the east flashes to the west, when lightning flashes across a dark sky, is that very secret? Not at all. 
Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven, Matthew 16 says, with all his glory. That's certainly not a secret event. Then all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. So the righteous look up and say, this is our God. We've waited for him and he'll save us. The unrighteous, the tribes of the earth, the, this is not some secret rapture where God kind of raptures away a few people. Not at all. The tribes of the earth mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven and great glory. You know, Revelation 1, 7 says he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. Psalm 50, verse 3 says our God comes and will not keep silent. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With a what? With a what, everybody? Shout. With the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus is coming in all of his glory. The Son of Man came once as a babe in Bethlehem's manger and very few people understood his coming. But he's coming again, not quietly as the babe in Bethlehem's manger. He's coming in glory. He's coming in power. He's coming as the King of Kings. He's coming as the Lord of Lords. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his what? In his what? In his glory. All the holy angels with him. He will sit on the throne of his glory. He came as a babe in Bethlehem's manger once as Savior of the world to save us from sin. He ushered in the kingdom of grace. But now he comes as King of kings, Lord of lords on his throne to usher in the kingdom of glory. So here are the points in Revelation 14. Jesus is coming. He's going to execute judgment when he comes. The destiny of the nations and all humanity will be decided for eternity. Now, where else is the Son of Man mentioned in the Bible? If you have your Bible with you, take it and turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Because this Son of Man expression is a rich expression in Scripture. Daniel chapter 7, we read verse 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, the air of his head like pure wool. His throne is a fiery flame, his wheels is burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand ministered unto him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court or judgment was seated, the books were open. Here's a picture of the supreme court of the universe. Satan has challenged the government of God. Satan has said God is unfair and unjust. But here in the judgment, tens of thousands of angels, a thousand times, ten thousand times ten thousand. How much is ten thousand times ten thousand? It's a hundred million. And then thousands of thousands, that's an infinite number. So cherubim and seraphim and beings from unfallen worlds are there. And this is the judgment. The hour of God's judgment has come. Before the whole universe, they look on. And Jesus reveals that he's done everything possible to save every person. That he sent his Holy Spirit to their heart. He's brought conviction to them. He's arranged providences in their life. If you and I are lost, it's not because Jesus did not do every single thing possible to save us. It's because we turned our backs on that salvation. But notice what it says in verse 13 and 14. John says, I watched in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Look, look, the Son of Man appears in the judgment. Your friend is in the judgment. You need not fear in the judgment. Your knees not quake and tremble in the judgment. If you know Christ, you have the assurance of salvation in the judgment of God. The Son of Man is your friend. The Son of Man is the one that was tempted like you are tempted. The Son of Man is the one that gives us grace and mercy and goodness flow into our lives. See, the question in the judgment is not good deeds weighed against bad deeds. It's not, oh, this person committed 10,422 bad deeds and they only committed 10,421 good deeds. Therefore, that no. The question in the judgment, is this man, is this woman one of Christ's? Has this man, has this woman committed their life to Christ? 
has this man and this woman known Jesus and has his power changed their life? Do they have one desire to please Jesus? Do they have one desire to do the will of God? You see, on the cross of Calvary, the sacrifice of Christ was enough to save you. The death of Christ is enough to save you. The righteousness of Christ is enough to cover your sins. In Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, we can be saved in his kingdom. He is the son of man in the judgment that will represent us before the throne of God. He is the son of man who comes again to redeem us. But look, if you have not accepted Jesus, or if you're some complacent Christian, if for you religion is just a plaything, if it's just something superficial, if it has not transformed your life, then you must fear the judgment because we cannot go into that judgment without Christ taking our lives fully and completely. And that's the message of the three angels. It's the message of the gospel. It's the message to get a people ready not to play games with religion, not to play games with Jesus, not to put on some religious cloak and make believe that they are Christians. But it is a call. It's a call to confession. It's a call to repentance. It's a call to know Christ deeply. It's a call to have your life changed. Now when Jesus comes, remember what it said in Revelation 14, verse 14? It says, I looked and saw one coming, the Son of Man, on a white cloud. And he had a crown upon his head. You know the word for crown is Stephanus there. And that's the victor's crown. Christ comes as victor. He, Christ, comes to vanquish evil. Christ comes as the triumphant Lord. Christ comes to usher in a new heavens and a new earth. Evil will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. Sin and suffering will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. Wickedness will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. The devil will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. Death will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will have the last word. But look, as John looks up, he sees the Son of Man coming. He sees the sickle in his hand. He sees the reaping of the harvest of the earth. That first harvest is the harvest of golden grain. The harvest of righteousness. But then he looks up and he sees another harvest. Revelation 14, verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple saying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now notice this text. The Son of Man is ready to come. But an angel comes out of God's temple and says to the Son of Man, Jesus, it's time. It's time. It's time. Go get your children. It's time now because the harvest of the earth is ripe. In the final harvest, every seed has gone to harvest. That's why the Bible says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. And he that is unholy, let him be unholy still. There will come a day when every human being living on planet Earth will make their final irrevocable decision for or against Christ. Probation closes not because God runs out of mercy, but if God would keep the door of probation open for another year, 10 years, or 100 years, nobody else would make their decision. So it's not, oh, probation may close, and I'm so afraid because... Uh, no. It's rather, God today is bringing conviction to people's hearts. God today, through his Holy Spirit, is leading men and women to make eternal decisions for him. And when every human being on planet Earth has made their final irrevocable decision, when they've had adequate information to do that, human probation will close. Not because God's mercy has run out, not because God doesn't love anymore, but because God has done everything he can. He's done everything he could to save every human being. And the angel, according to Revelation 14, looks at the 
the Son of Man. He says, it's time now. Go get children. They've suffered enough. They're in enough war, enough famine, enough heartache, enough sorrow. Your children are ready now. They've made that full commitment to you. But then, what happens? There's another harvest. It's not only the harvest of the righteous. Revelation 14, verse 7 to 20, 17 to 20 says this, And another angel came from the altar who had power over fire. What's this power over fire? These are the fiery judgments of God. This is, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, our God is a consuming fire. So when Christ comes the second time, the wicked are consumed with the brightness of his coming. They are, the, they, they are consumed at that moment the, and, uh, to the, with the fiery flames of Christ when he comes. But when Christ comes, the righteous look up and they say, this is our God, we've waited for him and will save us. Hey, look, if you have a clay pot and you put the clay pot in a fiery kiln, what happens to that clay? It gets hard, right? What if you put a wax candle in that same kiln? What would happen to it? It would melt the same heat. So when Jesus comes the second time, we see his glory. And we are just so overwhelmed. We say, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he'll save us. But the same fiery presence of Christ in which we see his glory, the wicked run for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. And they're destroyed at that moment by the brightness of his coming, only to be raised at the end of the thousand year millennial period. Look, I saw another angel come out of the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had a sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse bridle, 600 furlongs. Look, what scripture says, the Lord himself is moving powerfully here. I want you to go back to Revelation. Revelation, the 14th chapter. Revelation chapter 14. This text on the screen, we missed one word on it, and I just noticed it and, uh, because it's, it's really an important one. Revelation 14, in the Bible, this is what it says, verse 20. And the winepress was trampled outside the city. Blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So the text should say 1,600 furlongs. How much is 1,600? How much is that? 1,600. Come on, you're, you're good mathematicians. 1,600, right? I, well, that was no trick question. 1,600 furlongs is what? How much is that? 1,600. How much is a furlong? One-eighth of a mile. So one-eighth is 1,600. Some mathematician out here. You don't need your phone for this one. Come on. Well, okay, 16. Okay, that's what? That's 200, right? 200 miles. So if it's 1,600 furlongs, and a furlong is an eighth of a mile, it's 200 miles. What is John trying to say here? What is John trying to say? If you go from the north of Israel to the south of Israel, it's 180 to 200 miles. And what John is saying is this, in Revelation 14, all of evil will be totally destroyed. He's using Israel in something that they knew as an illustration for the destruction, the total destruction of evil, the total destruction of all wickedness. So here's what we see in Revelation 14 that prepares us to understand the message to get ready for the second coming of Christ. We see two harvests. The harvest of golden grain, men and women totally sold out for Christ. And the harvest of gory grapes, men and women totally sold out against Christ. In the last days of Earth's history, there is no middle ground. In the last days of earth's history, every human being will make their final, irrevocable decision, full and complete. Every human being will either accept that Christ created me, Christ fashioned me, Christ died for me, Christ lives for me. Every human being will come to that decision 
For me to live is Christ, as Paul said, and to die is gain. As Jesus said in John 8, verse 29, I do always those things that please him. As Jesus said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Christ in this generation is looking for a group of people that want to do only one thing, and that is to please him. Every seed will go to harvest. Every seed will go to harvest. Men and women totally for Christ, or men and women sold out to the evil one. The fruit we produce in our lives is the result of the seed we sow in our lives. The choices that we make every day are determining our eternal destiny. And look, you cannot sow seeds of evil in your life and reap righteousness. You cannot sow seeds of immorality and reap purity. You cannot sow seeds of, of dishonesty and reap honesty. We are sowing seeds for that final harvest today. You cannot sow seeds of worldliness and reap heavenly mindedness. And if, the, if you're spending three, four, five hours on TV with its Hollywood drama, you are sowing worldliness and not reaping heavenly mindedness. You cannot sow seeds of intemperance and abuse your body and, and reap health. You see, the message of Christ for the final generation is not so this message, oh, just love Jesus and do whatever you want. No, it's a message that leads us to confession and repentance. It's the message of John the Baptist that prepared a people for the first coming of Christ. Well, we're, we're not like little kids wading in some little wading pool up to our ankles trying to pick up a penny. We're diving for pearls. We're diving for pearls. And the greatest pearl is the pearl of great price, Jesus Christ. There's nothing that can satisfy like Jesus. There's nothing that can bring joy to our hearts like Jesus. There's nothing that can bring peace to our souls like Jesus. You see, I love that statement written in one of my favorite books, The Great Controversy, that says the mind, let's read it together. You ready to read? Let's read it. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it dwells. Every day our mind is being shaped. Every day our mind is being conditioned. Every day we're sowing seeds, either seeds of righteousness or seeds of evil. Seeds of goodness that, prepare, that develop a character like Jesus or seeds of, of worldliness that produce a different kind of character. In every harvest there are distinct and somewhat certain laws of sowing and reaping. Look, if I plant corn, what do I expect to grow when I plant corn seed? Apple trees? Corn, you got it. If I plant green beans, what do I expect to grow? Peach trees, right? No, I, green beans, right? So there's these laws of sowing and reaping. The law of the harvest is you reap what you sow. That's the law of the harvest. Galatians 6 verse 7, it says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he is going to what? Reap. Now notice this expression, God is not mocked. You know what the Greek original word for that mocked is in the New Testament? It's an interesting word. It means to turn up your nose at or to treat with contempt or ridicule. In other words, you can't treat God with ridicule and contempt. We are living at a time and the moral values of America are falling apart. We're living at a time of declining righteousness in Western society. We're living just before, as, as society is collapsing, we're living at a time of the greatest event in the history of the ages. There is hope. There is hope. This world is not going to disintegrate and fall apart with evil dwelling and evil reigning and evil triumphing. Jesus Christ is going to come and he is preparing a people right now for his soon coming. Notice it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man, whatever a woman sows, they are going to reap. You sow good seed in your life and you're going to have positive results. And the sooner we start sowing good seed, the sooner the positive results are going to show up. You sow evil seed and you are going to result, you're going to have negative results. Everything reproduces after its kind. 
Carrots reproduce after their kind. Cucumbers produce after their kind. And when we sow seeds of righteousness by prayer, by faith, by Bible study, and when we do what God puts in our heart and act on the convictions that God puts in our heart. You know one of the devil's greatest games? You know, I read a story once. It was a fictitious story, but it really illustrates the point. The devil was going to go out of business. Man, that would be good news, wouldn't it? And he was going to have an auction. And he was going to auction off all his wares. And so they was having the highest bidder, you know, to the, in, the, in this particular auction the devil was going to have. And uh, he was auctioning off his wares. And he said, okay, what's going to bid for, for, for this one? And uh, what if we told people there was no God? What would you pay for that? What if we told people the Bible wasn't true? What would you pay for that? And then he said, what would you pay for if we just went down and told Christians and others, don't make any decisions, just wait. And as the story goes, everything else faded. The angels didn't want anything else. They said, look, we'll pay the highest price because we know if people hesitate, it gives the devil the opportunity to tempt them in ways that they could never have been tempted if they would have made eternal decisions for Christ. And therefore, the devil's secret weapon, when God convicts you to do something, I don't know what God's convicting you to do in your life right now, but when God convicts you to do something, whatever that thing is, if there's some habit in your life that God convicts you to do, say, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm feeble, but you're strong. Your power can enable me to overcome. If God is convicting you to move ahead, and obey him in some area of your life. Why wait? Why wait? It's not going to get any easier when you wait. Make that eternal decision. If God is convicting you, if you once walked with God's people and you drifted away, and God's convicting you to come back and, and be rebaptized, why wait? Make that decision. If you have been studying with God's people and God is moving upon your heart to a decision for baptism, why not make that eternal decision for Christ? Look, we are not going to gain anything if we wait. You see, Jesus says this. You can't sow discord and produce unity. You can't sow lies and produce truth. You can't sow sin and produce holiness. And you can never overcome any of those things by waiting without the power of God in your life. You see, if we indeed fill our mind with spiritual values and make spirituality our priority. We reap the fruit of sowing that. But if we sow indifference, if we sow uh, indifference to God and spiritual values, if we do that, we reap the fruit of, of indifference, apathy, spiritual complacency. We reap the fruit of frustration. If we wait and we are not serious about our faith, and if we're apathetic about it, and don't make decisions, what happens? We become spiritually complacent in all that. Now look, you sow a thought, and you're going to reap an act. You sow an act, and you're going to reap a habit. You sow a habit, and you're going to reap a character. And you sow a character, and you're going to reap eternal destiny. So what do we want to do? Sow positive thoughts. Act on those positive thoughts. Develop positive habits. And by the grace of God, develop a positive attitude. The promise and warning of Scripture is that we reap what we sow. Now, there are two fatal mistakes that people make, and here's what they are. And many Christians make these fatal mistakes. First, some people look back to yesterday, and they say, look what I did yesterday. They feel so guilty. They feel so condemned about what they did yesterday that they can't move forward today. Some people look at tomorrow and they say, if I make this decision for Christ, what's going to happen on my job? What's going to happen among my friends? What's going to happen among my family? So some people look to the past, and they are filled with guilt. Some people look to the future, and they're filled with anxiety. The past is but a memory. The future is but a dream. And what you have is today. Today and today, this moment is yours. It is yours for Christ. It is yours to make an eternal decision for Jesus. God is longing to do 
new things in our lives. If you have your card, would you please take that out right now? God is longing to do some amazing new things in our life. The Bible says, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, choose you this day in whom you'll serve and let it be what? Let it be the Lord. Look, it's harvest time. On your card, if you need help in solving some problem, just take that card out. You may need a pen. Just raise your hand if you need a pen. Ushers, would you come into the aisles too? Somebody may not have gotten a card. And this is a very sacred moment in our meetings. A very, very sacred moment. Where we can ask God to come into our life. There may be some problem that we need solved. We may need help with financial needs. There may be some problem in our health. And we're going to have fill out the cards and then we're going to bring the, our ushers will bring them forth and I'll pray. I'll come down and I'll pray over these cards. Because I've seen God work miracles. People have filled out their cards and they've said, Pastor Mark, pray, pray for me. I have an undesirable habit. They're, or you may need relatives you want us to pray for. A son, a daughter, a husband or wife. Just, just fill that out there. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to touch them. And so if you need a card, just raise your hand. Then you'll put your name on a card, your address, your state, and if you want to put your phone, your email, whatever you want to put on, you can put on. If you have a home church, you can put that on. You know, I love that old song, what a friend we have in what? Jesus. All our sins in what? Griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. You know, that song was written by Joseph Scriven. Joseph Scriven was in his 20s. And he was engaged to be married to a wonderful young woman. And as they planned the wedding, they had the church reserved. They had the banquet hall reserved for the reception. And his fiancée decided to go swimming the night before the wedding. Unfortunately, she drowned. Joseph Scriven was so incredibly devastated that he decided to leave the British Isles, move way up into the woods in Canada. He thought he could never love again. His fiancée died the night before the wedding. Ten years later, he met the love of his life. They were engaged. And unfortunately, a few weeks before the wedding, she died of a terrible lung disease. Joseph Scriven was devastated. He had little money. He was working up in the woods. And he got a telegram from England that his mother was dying. One day he sat down, and with tears coming down his eyes, he wrote to mother. And these are the words he wrote. Mother, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials or temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? What a friend we have in Jesus. We are living on the knife edge of eternity. Jesus is your friend. He's the Son of Man. He's coming back to take you home. Is there something tonight that you need some problem, you need help in solving it? And for you, this is decision night. You're going to say, Jesus, help me with that. Somebody has some financial need, Jesus, help me. Somebody has some health need, Jesus, help me. Somebody has some undesirable health. Come, and Jesus' arms are open for you tonight. Leave your burden here. Don't go home with the same burden you came with. Leave your burden here. And know that whatever decision you have made tonight, the living Christ will give you power for victory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for those that have filled out cards. Thank you, Lord, so much that you are a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. Thank you that Christianity is not some kind of a philosophy. It's not simply a philosophy. 
that it is the power of God unto salvation. Thank you that Christ forgives us, that Christ delivers us from the bondage of the evil one, and that the Son of Man, our friend, is coming soon to take us home. We want to be in that harvest of righteousness. We want to see Jesus come and triumph with him through all the ages. Now, Lord, I especially pray for those who've come forward tonight. You know their hearts. You know their backgrounds. Hold them in your hand. And thank you, Jesus, that you will take them from here to eternity, that what you began in them, you will finish. In Christ's name, amen.